Welcome to Unit 3, and the topic or the title of Unit 3 is called Rate of Change. And today what I'm doing is I'm looking at review of necessary skills. Now, uh, you have the blank uh, note, so what I'm going to do, you can pick and choose what needs to be copied out. Uh, you can pause the video when you want to uh, copy what you want to copy. So, going through here, the first thing that you need to know goes back to your grade 9 course. You need to know your exponent laws. And your five exponent laws are listed here. So we have our multiplication law, division law, power of power law, zero exponent law, and negative exponent law. All right. Key properties for those exponent laws are listed right here. So for law one and two, you must have the same bases. And for all our exponent laws, base cannot be zero. And I have a couple of examples over here. Um, remember that the bases have to be the same in order to simplify. Remember when you are doing a power of power, that 3, the external exponent, needs to be distributed into each term inside the bracket. And then also we talked about in the grade 11, and you saw more experience with that in the grade 12 course, is that when you have like expressions in the numerator and the denominator, that they also simplify. All right, so you make the decision as to what you need to copy in order to be successful with that topic. Next, we're looking at radicals. So with radicals, you dealt with that in the grade 11 course, and they will come up uh, from time to time in our course. So our basic properties, uh, one of the basic properties here is addition. It's like adding like terms. So the square root of A is a like term. So we can add all the square roots of A together as like terms, so it's like collecting x's or y's. Um, similarly, the second example here has a mixture of root a's and cube root of a's. So cube root of a is not the same as square root of a, so you need to add your like terms together. So the cube roots of a would go together, and then finally that square root of a would be separate from that. Third property I point out here, is that if you're multiplying two radicals together, it is simply the square root of the product of the radicands, so a times b. Doing division, virtually the same as multiplication, except you're dividing what's inside the radicals. Then we talk about changing a uh, entire radical to a mixed radical. We're not going to do this a whole lot in, in this particular course. Uh, it doesn't come up very often but it is a skill you need to have heading into any of the university programs uh, that require you to take a math course. And here you're looking at going from mixed to entire. So again, just looking at number 5 again, the 54, I can break it into a perfect cube. 27 is a perfect cube. That's 3 times 3 times 3. So I take the cube root of the 27 and it becomes a 3. And then the rest of them, the a to the fifth, I break it into a cubed times a squared because cube root of a cubed is just a, and that's how that a gets out there by itself. All right. Um, with example six, everything gets everything that's outside or in front of the radical gets put to the exponent four, the indice. So our indice is a four there. So it'd be two to the fourth and then a squared to the fourth, and it's just simplification from there. What's more important, what's going to be more common here, uh, is this right here, rationalizing the denominator. Uh, you dealt with it a little bit last semester in the MHF course. This semester it's going to rear its head again, especially in the trig unit. So the original question's in blue, so 2 over root 2. The general rule of thumb is you cannot leave a radical in your denominator for your final answer. So how do you get rid of it? Well, you multiply by 1, and it looks like root 2 over root 2. So you multiply the top by root 2, multiply the bottom by root 2. When you multiply root 2 times root 2, it just it's an inverse operation. It gets rid of the square root sign. You're just left with 2, and therefore your 2's cancel. So 2 divided by root 2 is just root 2. Now, the one that uh, I don't know whether you had a chance to see, um, when you have a question that looks like this, 3 over 1 plus root 2, so the denominator is an expression, 
we have to multiply by, by what we call the conjugate. And here's the note for conjugate. So conjugate is the exact same expression except opposite signs. So 1 plus root 2, the conjugate would be 1 minus root 2. If I gave you, for example, root 3 minus 4, the conjugate would be root 3 plus 4. So we need to take the conjugate of that denominator, the 1 plus root 2, So, and I multiply top and bottom by the 1 minus root 2. We multiply by the conjugate because if you look at the denominators now, this is a difference of squares. Okay. So if it's a difference of squares, the middle term will fall out, and that means we have no radical. And I show this when I do the note over here. So on top, I multiply the 3 by the 1 minus root 2, and I don't bother distributing it in. Here is the expansion, so I foiled it. Okay, and it's the long steps, but it's just to show that those middle terms fall out. So all I'm really left with when the root 2s cancel out is 1 minus 2. So I just end up with negative 1 in the denominator. So I divide the 3 by negative 1. And here's the final expression. So originally the 1 plus root 2 is equal to, or that expression is equal to, that right there. So that's going to come up in this unit and in the fourth unit. So you need to be able to multiply by or rationalize the denominator by either multiplying by the radical itself or by multiplying the fraction by the conjugate. And you'll see that when the time comes up, and I'll remind you when it does. All right, function notation. Huge topic for us with the function notation. Um, the function notation is introduced to you in the grade 11 course and becomes uh, very important last semester and even more so important as you move through this particular unit. So before in grade 9 and 10, so just a quick walk down memory lane, we taught you the y equals format. And one of the big problems when in the grade 11 course, I always tell students is if you want to do a substitution, you have to put a let statement in, you have to go let x equals 2, and then do your substitution. So it's a lot of extra work. Same notation, 5x plus 2, but f of x replaces the y. It's really equal to each other. So keep in mind, maybe I have this, I do have it below here. Okay, f of x is just equal to y. It's just another way of writing the y. All right, the importance of this, though, is that it makes the substitution easier. So if you want to know, or I want to know what f of 2 is, you don't need a let statement because you're already telling me I'm replacing all my x values with 2. So you can do the substitution. So as I said, uh, it should be fairly familiar just jumping out of the other grade 12 course. All right, where are you heading? Eventually, um, you get into multivariable expressions. This is more university. We will not be dealing with that this year but it becomes fxy, meaning you can substitute in or you get multivariable expressions and so on and so forth. So that's where it's heading down the road for those that are going to continue, um, continue through math. One of the things I want to point out is that this right here, uh, f of x, and then if it's to the exponent negative 1, it's what we call inverse notation. So you did that last unit or last semester in the MHF, um, and it's very, very important to remember the notation, because the notation, you can't get it confused with our new notation I'm going to be introducing to you uh, as we enter into the calculus unit. And here's that notation. It's going to be f to the 1, f to the double 1, uh, and I'll talk about what that means when we get into it a little further into this unit. All right. Uh, that's an example of finding the inverse. We don't actually need to do this. I'm trying to think if we ever come across this in the calculus, and I don't believe so. All right, so there you go. That is the, uh, the entire uh, rundown on function notation. Factoring, uh, you're never going to get rid of it. Okay, your factoring is going to be there. Um, quite, you're going to be doing more factoring this unit than you did before. So we have our types, and I'm not going to go through them all because you should be able to factor by this point in time. So you have common factoring. You have your perfect square, difference of squares is the second one you look at. Simple trinomials is the third type of factoring you would use in the steps. And finally, complex trinomials. And you should be fairly uh, apt by now. And finally, what we're going to run into uh, as we move through this unit for sure is synthetic division. So that process in which you are dividing cubics 
So this particular expression, you're going to have to factor. Now you're not going to have to factor as often as you did with the previous course, but it's still a requirement to go through. And, and I've given an example here. So if you want it for your note, um, but to be quite honest, it should be fairly fresh in your notes. In fact, you should have your grade 12 notes in the same binder so you can make quick reference. All right, but factoring uh, is a must and a requirement. So if you have any troubles with that, you need to come talk to me and we'll help iron out any of your issues. A couple of things that come up in the course that you haven't seen before. Inequality is an absolute value. So our inequalities would involve any of these signs. Okay, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, not equal to. Um, from time to time they come in. I know you've done uh, inequalities with rational functions last semester. I'm not sure, sure how much work or how much you knew about it, but here are the keys when you're solving an equation with inequalities right here. So the first thing is uh, you solve it the exact same as an equal sign. So whether it's a less than or greater than or a, a not equal to or whatever, you just treat it like a regular algebra question. Point number two, when you multiply or divide both sides, and this is the only change, you switch the direction of the inequality. So example number two shows this. So I'll just go through it. So the first thing you would do if you're solving for x, you would subtract 6 from both sides, which I show, which leaves me with negative 2x less than or equal to 6. To isolate x, we're going to divide both sides by negative 2. If you divide or multiply both sides by a negative number, the direction of the sign changes. And you can see I've circled it in red. The, the direction of that sign changes. So that's the only difference when you are solving with inequalities. Absolute value, again, you haven't come across it or dealt with it too much. It comes up again from time to time, so it's not a central concept. It's one of those ones that kind of have slipped through the curriculum. But absolute value of x, it is a measurement of the distance a value is from 0. So negative 2 and 2 are the same distance from 0, so they are simply 0. So for the people that are coming and have done the physics, you can look at it as a scalar value. Okay, the scalar value, it's just how far away are you from 0. All right. Uh, a couple of examples here. So the absolute value of 9 is equal to 9, okay, because it's asking basically how far are you away from 0. So it would be 9 units. We don't have to solve inequality equations very often, um, but when they do come up, uh, this is how you'd handle them. So absolute value of 2x minus 1. You have to break it into two components because if you look at number one, inside that absolute value, it could have been a positive 9 or a negative 9 to get 9. So there's two possible answers. So over here, I look at 2x minus 1 as being a positive value. And over here, I assume it was a negative value. And what happens is you get two, two answers. So we get negative 4 and 5 when you go through and solve them because there was two possible solutions. It depended on what side of zero it was on. And that's how that's dealt with. All right. So last two things uh, I'm going to talk about quickly. I'll talk about sigma notation. It comes up in the homework, not a requirement for this course. So when we do get uh, to the one lesson that deals with it, I'm going to go into it in a little bit more detail. Uh, but if you copy down this information, um, and like I said, I'll, I'll talk about it in a lot more detail with the one particular unit that it's tied to. And finally, series and sequence. You're supposed to cover this in the 3U course. I don't know how much of it you actually got to because this is one of the units that if Mrs. Broadhagen doesn't have time to get to, I always tell her, don't worry about it. Uh, it's not a huge uh, component for this course. Again, there's only two notes that involve it and I review it in detail. If you want to copy this out, if you did see it, then it'll come back to you fairly simply, uh, simple. It's just a series of two formulas here. So for arithmetic, here are the important formulas. And for geometric, here are the two important formulas. All right. So if you can get those copied down, or this note copied down, and like I said, we can go over it in more detail as it arises but uh, don't feel that you're behind when it comes to the, this material. So this will allow us to get going on this particular unit. And we'll see you in the next video.